and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Shall we pray? May such baptismal power be ours as well. As we live out the promises that we have made or that have been made on our behalf, in the name and for the sake of Jesus, amen. Well, the Christmas season is now officially completed probably been unofficially completed for some time, but now that very brief season of the year, just literally 12 days in length, the 12 days of Christmas, has entered into the status of ghost of Christmas past. It is now behind us again. And so we find ourselves entering into a season much lesser known, the season of Epiphany, which shall also be this year a rather brief season of the year. Uh, Only five Sundays in Epiphany this year because of the early date for Easter, which is March the 27th, which means that Ash Wednesday is, can you believe this, one month from today. Epiphany is very brief this year, a season that commemorates, which explains our first hymn today, the arrival of the wise men, the three kings, we three kings of Orient are, who come to the light, the light of the world that is now revealed to the world, and not just to his own people, but to the Gentile world as well, the light of the world that comes to all. The traditional reading for the first Sunday of Epiphany, which is today, Epiphany itself was this past Thursday, January the the 6th, it's always January the 6th. The first Sunday of Epiphany is the story of, again, Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan at the hands of John the Baptist. A story that should be familiar to us by now. We looked at it twice earlier in Advent, the second and third weeks of Advent, courtesy of the lectionary. And now we look at it a third time, but from a slightly different angle. But but maybe some of you, some of you, like me, are ready to, well, pack it up. (laughs) To put it with the other Christmas paraphernalia and decorations and take John the Baptist, whom we much admire, and put him away and his story till next year. I understand that. Great story, but three times in six weeks? Hmm. And maybe, like me, you're also a bit curious about those missing verses. I don't know if you noticed, maybe you did, that the lectionary prescribed reading for today has a hole in it. I didn't make that up. If you look in the back of your bulletin down in the lower left corner, the lectionary readings for each Sunday are given. They're not mine. They are made up by some anonymous force (laughs) somewhere uh, smarter than me who puts together Old Testament epistle gospel readings for each uh, Sunday in a three-year cycle. So this is the suggested reading for today, verses 15, 16, 17. But 18, 19, and 20 are missing. And then we come back to 20 and 21. 
I wondered about that. It's not always easy to decipher the logic of those who put together uh, the lectionary. Sometimes it is. Sometimes when there's a hole in the reading, it's rather easy to find out why. It's a, a, a perhaps a part of the reading that's kind of tedious, perhaps tendentious a bit, uh, perhaps uh, a bit of a genealogy or a flashback that doesn't add to our understanding. And so to streamline the reading, something is left out. But that's not the case today, as I hope to make clear. The, the verses left out are not uh, genealogical. They're not a rehash of something that has already happened. They are left out for another reason. I find myself wondering why. Uh, the story opens, um, obviously enough, with uh, a reminder, uh, uh, an announcement that John is a popular figure. He is baptizing in the River Jordan. All of Jerusalem has come out to him. He has become so popular with the people that there's even rumblings that he could be the one. Maybe, maybe he's the Messiah we've been looking for. And graciously and humbly, John denies it. No, no, no. He said, I'm not the one. There is one coming after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy even to untie. When he comes, oh, when he comes, he shall gather the wheat into his barn, and the chaff he shall burn with an unquenchable fire. Then the text says, and with many other words, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Isn't that an interesting definition of good news? The wheat shall be gathered into the barn. That's good news for them. But the chaff shall be burned with unquenchable fire. They might not think of this announcement as being quite so upbeat, quite such good news. But then comes the missing verses. I don't know if you read ahead or if you've checked that out, but what it's about is John the Baptist running afoul of King Herod because John dared to point out publicly some dalliances of King Herod with his brother's wife, Herodias. The king was not amused. He had John tossed into a prison cell, a cell because we've read the full story, we know he shall not escape with his head still connected to his shoulders. These are the missing verses. And I did find myself wondering why. Why would you just skip over that part? Now, I don't know for sure. Whoever these anonymous forces are that write the lectionary, they don't keep me in the loop. I never get a note. I wish I would, but I never get a note in the mail saying, Crooks, we just wanted to bring you up to date with what we're thinking and why we're doing what we're doing. I never get that, so I don't know for sure. But what I think is at least part of the reason is because of a growing tendency in our culture, and in our church, I think, to assume that good news always ought to be upbeat news. That, that good news ought to always be encouraging, upbeat, positive, happy stuff. Like Lucy Van Pelt, in the Charlie Brown comic strip, who once says to Charlie, I don't want any downs, I just want ups and more ups and then more ups on top of that. We sometimes want that as well, do we not? A church, a faith, a religiosity where never is heard a discouraging word. And while I'm not a big devotee of discouragement. I'm not into discouragement, at least I try not to be. I think I've also discovered that a failure to acknowledge that sometimes life can be tough, 
that life sometimes isn't fair or happy or encouraging can make things worse by simply our failure to so acknowledge it. To acknowledge the fact that sometimes we do feel more like chaff than wheat. And that when we're always told that we ought never feel discouraged, and it's sometimes unfaithful not to always feel encouraged, the feelings of defeat and depression and despair are all the worse when they come. And the Bible, the Bible I think, is so wonderfully realistic, so wonderfully honest about this. It, it tells us John had his ups. <laughs> he was so popular that people thought this could be the guy, this could be the man. But it never denies then also telling us that sometimes for no sin greater than just telling the truth, he is thrown into prison from which he shall not escape. And isn't that the world for you? Isn't that just the way it is sometimes where, as the saying goes, no good deed goes unpunished. Yes, Epiphany is about the arrival of three kings, but it also has within it the truth that not every king comes bearing gifts and that Herod is not amused by John's truthfulness. And I don't know but what things have changed much in that regard. The, the old famous hymn that says we have a story to tell to the nations may be true, but I've also discovered that the nations aren't always ecstatic about hearing it. The gospel may be good news, and indeed it is, but it also divides the world into both wheat and chaff. And so we should not be surprised to discover that some will always respond to that good news with pure apathy and others with pure anger and hostility. Hasn't changed. Churches are not burned and vandalized for nothing. The job that is ours as proclaimers of gospel and livers out of gospel are not always unaware of its dangers. Our secular age does not always embrace us with open arms. I was reading just before Christmas an article in Christian Century Magazine written by Craig Barnes. That name sounds familiar. Craig has preached from this pulpit uh, most recently just a few years ago when Beth Arnold Crickbaum was ordained and installed as pastor of Sandy Lake. And she invited her favorite professor from Pittsburgh Seminary, i.e. Craig Barnes, to come up and preach that Sunday. And so Craig was here uh, performing that, that task and just recently was installed as the new president of Princeton Seminary. Uh, and it was while fulfilling that duty that he was called upon, I'm sure presidents of seminaries and universities are often asked to kind of do honorary sort of things. And he was asked to bring greetings to the class of 1965, celebrating their 50th class reunion. And Craig was saying what a joy that was in this article and that meeting with them, uh, discovering what a talented and hardworking group they were and very gifted. He said, couldn't help but be impressed but he said there was just beneath the surface a sort of, um, I'm not sure what word he did use now, sadness, uh, despair, unpleasantness, just beneath the surface. And he kind of was so touched by that, so aware of it, that he kept digging a little bit and came to the conclusion that it had something to do with the fact that this was the first graduating class in history, the history of the world, that during their entire tenure of ministry, the church had not increased in membership one single year. Every single year was a decline. First time it's ever happened. 
Uh, it's going to happen again this year in all likelihood with the graduating class of 1966. But the class of 65 was the first class where you had talented, hardworking people who had given their all to the church and numerically speaking had nothing at all to show for it. Now there were successes, I trust. There were things that were upbeat and encouraging and good and decent and wholesome. But this was the first group that said and could point to the fact that at least those who were Presbyterian, there had not been one year where the overall membership had ticked upwards. And he said, you could feel it. You could feel it in that graduating class. And he used that article to conclude with the words, the church that we live in and work in today is a church where it's not always easy where the messages and rewards that come our way are not always obvious or even present. The Herods of this world will not be silenced by our simply deciding to ignore them. The news of virtually every day reminds us of how tough it is out there, how tough it is to be anything but how tough it can be to be faithfully Christian as well. Not every king comes bearing gifts, and we forget that at our peril. And simply leaving out inconvenient verses will not change reality. The light that goes forth into the darkness will be met by more darkness. That's just how it is. I'm comforted, though, by that basic reality that the scripture is so wonderfully honest and realistic about how that is, how it was, how it is, how probably it always will be. Not every king comes bearing gifts. Shall we pray? God, may we find the good news despite the darkness of our world and even our church and go forth boldly willing to proclaim and to live out what is never easy to proclaim or live out through Christ our Lord. Amen.
now may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship and communion of Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us now and forever. Amen.